Uh, so this is a presentation on parametric expressions, uh, which is a proposed language feature for C++. Uh, the paper is P1221, uh, the author of which is myself, Jason Rice. Um, <clears throat> I have a reference implementation on Godbolt, uh, but just as a disclaimer, um, there's a few changes in like the declaration syntax that I'm proposing here in this pre presentation that diverges from the paper and the implementation. Uh, and it's just based off of uh, iterative pr improvements based on feedback and you know during the course of uh, making the slides for the presentation you know some ideas came up. Uh, so yeah. Uh, the, the talk is separated into three parts. Uh, what are parametric expressions? And, and this is the lion's share of, of most of the talk is just going over uh, the mechanics of the different features that it has. Um, it's actually really simple, but uh, it can be hard to explain. And um, uh, we'll be going over these like um, in breadth, not not too kind of like a surface level look. And um, and then we'll go on to uh, some motivating use cases that kind of puts it together. And um, uh, you know. I'll try to bring on uh, the hard sell of, uh, and explain why we need parametric expressions in C++. Um, and then after that, uh, we'll go into some crazy library stuff. Uh, it's just at the end, um, I have a demonstration where I substituted function calls with parametric expressions in ac accessing a tuple in, in Boost HANA. Uh, and uh, yeah. So what are parametric expressions? Are they nonsense? No, they're not nonsense. They are a hygienic macro on expressions. And this occurs during semantic analysis and template instantiation. <clears throat> um, and, and to understand why this is, um, what the value of working with expressions is, uh, let's take a look at uh, the difference between expressions and objects. And I'm, I'm basically going to uh, ask a question, and you can just blurt out what you think the answer is. And it's just, it's really simple, but uh, I have to phrase the question correctly. So uh, to fill out this table, for objects, uh, do you think that an object has a type? Yeah, yes. All right. So yes. <laughs> All right, does uh, an object get stored? Yes. yes. And then uh, you could say that's like the fundamental purpose of a, an object is that it's the program's way of storing information. So, yes. Uh, does an object show up in the final program? Maybe mostly. Right, yeah, so maybe. <laughs> uh, so uh, it could be, an object could be used in a, an unevaluated context, uh, like in some meta programming, or it could even be optimized out so it wouldn't necessarily be in the target. Now for expressions, does an expression have a type? All right, so I'm going to say maybe on this one. And the reason is, uh, so according to the standard, an expression has a type. It's not a reference type, but it has a value category, which could be uh, L value, R value. <clears throat> My argument is that not all expressions have types in that like you can think of uh, partial expressions, not like a full expression, but um, let, let's say a, an, uh, an expression that contains an unexpanded parameter pack. You don't know what its type is, so it doesn't necessarily have a type. Um, it, for our purposes, yes, oh, okay. but not according to the standard. The standard says an expression has a type, so I'm saying maybe. <laughs> so, um, right, right. They're not they're not expressions in the sense of the standard defines an expression, but um, for our cases, we're going to say maybe. Um, does an expression of storage. Depends on what you mean by that. Uh, can you refer to it in the program? Oh, yes. No. All right. So um, I'm going to say yes, but uh, <laughs> oh, I lost it. I'm going to say yes, but only if you first upload it to iCloud. <laughs> That's just a joke. Uh, no, they don't. Um, uh, if you want to think of expressions as being tangible, you could think of it as a series of instructions, and you can think of as expressions as being manipulators of objects. 
Uh, and uh, does an expression show up on the final program? Again, it's the same reason. Uh, maybe it could be uh, in some native programming context or um, it, get, it gets optimized down. So maybe. Uh, so the problem with functional programming in C++ is all the functions. <laughs> so you never want to go full functional. <laughs> Um, and, and the reason is, it, I like functional programming, but in C++ and, and in other languages too, when you go like, like really hardcore with the high order functions and functional programming, you can get increased compile times and possibly less optimized code. Um, and like uh, I worked in a JavaScript shop where we had some, some uh, tacit programming that would, would end up in a JavaScript program that take, takes uh, 30 seconds just to parse. So functional programming can be a problem as far as uh, that kind of stuff goes. So functions as we know them, uh, we can think of them as a mapping of a series of objects to a single object. Does everybody agree with that? Module void, but yeah. All right, so not, not including void. Um, <clears throat> for parametric expressions, and because that's, it's hard to say in, in repetition, I'm gonna call them uh, parmexpers from now on. Um, we can think of them as a mapping from a series of objects or expressions to a single expression. And uh, the reason uh, I'm saying object or expression is that um, in the default case, we, we map the inputs to an object or to a variable uh, so that we don't have the, the complications with uh, evaluation like you see in um, preprocessor macros. <clears throat> and there's a second variant of a parmexper. And that is one that maps a series of objects and expressions to a single object. And the reason for this is, is like, uh, um, so we can work with multiple statements um, and uh, like, like with a compound statement and possible multiple return values and that would have to coalesce to a single object. And uh, uh, I, I implemented this because it, if you think about like C++ 11 const expert, there was a lot of restrictions on const expert and we had to, um, we had to work with, uh, like in some cases, you had to work with ternary expressions instead of if-else statements. Um, <clears throat> and we eventually lifted that restriction because, uh, because that's, you know, it's difficult to, to write code that way. So yeah, um, again, uh, parametric expressions, or parmexper, is a hygienic macro on expressions. And uh, a theoretical um, declaration syntax, you could think of it as this. So we have the using keyword, and then a name, and then a, the parameter list, and then uh, like an assignment-like syntax uh, with the output expression, and then uh, it ends with a semicolon. But, um, and, and this is the way I would, I, I'm, um, I'm going to change the paper to propose. But if we wanted to make it consistent with function template, or abbreviated function template syntax, we could have a type specifier. And I would argue it would most often be auto reference. Um, and it has been suggested that we go with the full-blown template syntax and even have type deduction um, and everything that, that goes with that. Um, uh, <clears throat> so one issue with this, th this would be possible, and I'm not against doing that, uh, but it does add, um, because we actually allow the user to specify a type, it could be dependent on types in the enclosing um, like class or whatever, and uh, that would require instantiations to transform that type every time you instantiate one of these. <clears throat> um, and also, um, if you think of these perm experts as like a, a type alias, as a type alias is to a type, or we could think of these as a type alias to a function, um, you can't do type deduction and type aliases, uh, and, and that's, I, I believe that's because they're meant to be a lightweight alternative to meta functions. So uh, what do you guys think? I, I re would really like to poll the audience and see what you guys think would be the preferable declaration syntax. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, really? OK. <clears throat> <laughs> All right. So we'll save the opinions for later. Um, my opinion is I would like an abbreviated, abbreviated syntax. Um, and I, I believe that abbreviated function template syntax, and I could be wrong, I, I, don't, I wasn't there or anything like that, but 
Um, I think the reason for the type specifier is that um, <clears throat> it has to be backwards compatible with functions. And uh, so, so if we were to allow both, maybe we would allow both. Uh, we could possibly do the abbreviated, abbreviated syntax with, along with the template syntax, but it wouldn't be able to coexist with the, just the, the function template abbreviated syntax. <clears throat> so now we're going to talk about declaration syntax. <laughs> and uh, this is what it would look like. So again, uh, there's the using keyword and then a name. And then the parameter list does not have type specifiers. And, and in this case, it binds it to the, the inputs, the input expressions, to variables that uh, are a deduced reference, kind of like auto reference. And then on, on the right hand side, you have the output expression. And anywhere you, you use this in a call expression, uh, it would be as if you're just substituting uh, that expression with x plus 1. And it creates temporaries for x, x plus 1. Is there a question? Uh, and in the context of, or if you wanted to have declaration specifiers on it, like for instance, constexpr, we would have the constexpr declaration specifier followed by the name, and there's still no type specifier. And, and with these, I should, you know, I'm, I'm, I should mention that it allows constexpr parameters. And, and um, So in function templates, the question is, what does it mean to have um, context for parameters? In function templates, we, have, uh, we don't have function or context for parameters because, because it's compile time information. It kind of has to be embedded in like the type, or at least in the, the, function template or the function signature to make it unique. So every time you instantiate a function with a context for input, it would have to have the value of that in the function's type information. So since parmexpers, and I should have mentioned this, they, they don't have a type. There's no like a function that's created. It's just a substitution of expression during the, the template instantiation. So uh, that allows us to have um, context for inputs to our uh, deduce. Um, the question is, can the constexpertness of the input expression be deduced? Um, yes, it could be. Uh, in this case, we're restricting it to constexpert. Okay. But uh, so in, in the previous case, this, this cannot be constexpert inputs. Right. Yeah, so there would have to be special rules for when we would allow it to be constexpr, like if it was in a constexpr function, in a constexpr context, but uh, it's just a normal variable initialization in this case. So there, there's a distinction between constexpr and non-constexpr, and we can't, we can't just, I mean, I'm not saying we can't, um, but we would have to have you know, a check to see if it can be used in constexpr, and that's not typically how constexpr variable declarations work or normal variable declarations, they can't be used in context expert. Uh, well, essentially, this is going to be something that Yes, but it does, it creates temporaries. Uh, it binds the inputs to x and y. Why does it create temporaries? To control um, evaluation. Um, okay. So like, if, if you, if you didn't use y in this case, and we didn't bind it to a temporary, uh, y would not get evaluated. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's not, so this is the default case, and I'll get to macro parameters in a few minutes, yeah. but um, the default case is safe. Yeah, yeah, totally makes sense. But in the context of this case, what would that expression actually be? Would it be the same thing? It would just be an expression that, that adds to variables that were bound um, to context for variables. Um, so I would say it would be the same as just substituting x and y. Um, but and, and maybe that basically the use case for this is that um, 
if you want to restrict it to const expert immediately. It's almost like a concept. So you get an early error saying that, you know, in, in the interface of this, the input has to be const expert. And there, there are use cases for that. So the, the temporary, the question is, is can we use the temporary as an L value? The, the, the temporary is actually a deduced reference. So if, it, if the, it's input expression, I'll go back to this. So if the input expression to x is uh, its expression value category is an L value, then it's bound to an L value reference. But if the value category of the expression is an R value, it's bound to an R value reference. So it's the same as like auto ref ref or t ref ref, like a forwarding reference. The, Temporaries have the const exponents of the operator and its operands, right? Like, if, if you have a bunch of const expr uh, L values and you plus them together, then the resulting temporary is going to be const expr, and then you may assign it to a non const expr thing, but that's your fault, right? All right, so, <laughs> so the statement is that. If it's a temporary, and I'm not sure what you mean by temporary exactly. Um, the, the, the language create a temporary for the result of an expression that is itself comprised of R values, and if the operator is, sorry, not R values, const expert values, and if the operator is also const expert, the result is const expert. All right, so um, the state, same as that if you have a uh, temporary that's bound to R values that are const expert, the result should be const expert. Is that correct? Is that what you're saying? So maybe it should be like that. Uh, in my implementation, I just bind it to a variable. Right. I, I get it. But that variable's const expertness can and should be deduced. I also have another uh, comment for the const expert modifier. Right. It should probably be const eval, because that's what it means. Sorry, uh, const init. Sorry, yes. Because th that's what you're basically saying here. You're not saying this will be. You're basically saying this better be const expert or the program will not compile. That's literally what constant it is for. And well, it's also what const expert is for, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, const expert variable declaration. Sure, but that also means that it's cost. <laughs> uh, that's, so I'm I have to repeat, repeat everything you say. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll re revisit the context for variable declaration. And if you, this is just like the declaration syntax part of the talk. Um, so to, to recap, we have an assignment like uh, syntax, which is like a type alias. Um, and there's no type specifier. And this is like one of those languages like JavaScript or, or Python or whatever. Um, but don't worry, the types are still there. So it's just, it's like auto ref ref only without the auto ref ref. Um, so I'm arguing that we need, or we should, since we can, have a more abbreviated than abbreviated function template declaration syntax. And that's because we don't need backwards compatibility with functions. Um, and that we should hide the auto so they can't complain about never auto or always auto or whatever. <laughs> that's just a joke. Um, and some argue that you should never go full type inference. Uh, and if you look at the, the manual for Rust, the programming language, um, they, have, they allow type inference for variables, but not for parameter declarations. And they believe that they've hit some sweet spot between full type inference and no type inference. I don't know that they justify that or, or why, but uh, I'm arguing for these perm experts that we allow full type inference. I'm sorry? Uh, full type inference might be undecidable. Full type inference what? Uh, might be undecidable. Oh, it might be undecidable. Yeah, as in like choosing like sort of things. I don't think it matters in the actual. Open mic. Yeah. Uh, I'll need to read carefully through the like proposal, but I believe that full type inference might be undecidable. Uh, oh, you mean in Rust? In this case, in, in Rust as well, but in, uh, we are talking like this is probably more relevant. So, 
Right. This is just implicitly. Oh. Like, it's like okay. implicitly declaring auto reference. Okay. And uh, I'm going to go over that here in a second. <laughs> so there's three, essentially three kinds of parameters in Um The default behavior, as I said, is implicitly auto ref ref. So this is like full type inference, or at least my idea of full type inference. Um, and here's like a pseudo expansion of it. Um, so you can see here's the declaration. And then there's a call expression that calls the parmexper with the input expressions i plus plus and two. And here's the pseudo expansion. And it's like a, you can think of it as like a GNU statement expression where we have, you know, these, uh, the input expressions are bound to these, um, these uh, auto variables. And then the result of the expression is a plus b. And I just, I put the auto ref uh, just to, to uh, demonstrate that it's an L value. So does that, does that make sense so far? All right. So const expert parameters, the second type of parameter, is implicitly const expert auto. Although, you know, you have to specify const expert. And the reason for this, uh, this difference, is that uh, just basically from feedback was that some of the code generation was unexpected because people typically use const expert auto. They don't like specify a const expert auto reference. And uh, here's the pseudo expansion. Uh, once more, it's just the same thing, only with uh, context per variables. No, context per auto, just like a value. Does that is that too weird? Some some people might say that's weird. <laughs> I don't know. All right, so just. To recap what we have so far, no specifiers, auto ref ref, context for specifiers, auto. And then the third kind, oops, is the, uh, we use the using de declaration specifier. At, I'm adding using as a declaration specifier parameter. And <clears throat> it, uh, I keep swiping on this. It doesn't have a type. Or rather, the parameter is never really created. Um, and, and what it does is every time, so it has an, the parameter has an input expression, but the parameter never gets emitted. And, and what it does is when it, on, upon instantiation, every, everywhere you see an ID expression mentioning this parameter, uh, it simply substitutes the ID expression with the, uh, the input expression. And so these are called macro parameters. So it's like expanding the ID expression into something different. And uh, the ex pseudo expansion um, is uh, is kind of what people were expecting earlier. Is that it? Just there's no temporary. It just so so the inputs i and two, and it's just like adding i plus two. <clears throat> and interestingly, the way I originally implemented this is it would do an AST transformation, and I would lose the information about the call at the, about the call expression itself, but um, the problem was is I wasn't I wasn't able to do the binding of the parameters. So so now there's there's still an AST node that wraps this, so you can do a refactoring on it. So there's a there's a plus for that against preprocessor macros, uh, but still it, it can see through for like Safani purposes and whatnot. So does this does this make sense? Um, let's assume that would be a multiplication function or uh, using more, more than a times b, and then. So the concern is uh, about operator precedence, right? Yeah. All right, so I have a slide for that, like almost right after this, I think. So, so these are a substitution of expression semantics, not, not text. So with a preprocessor macro, I believe you would, you would have the operator precedence issue, right? Um, so here's an example with that operator precedence, precedence uh, that you just described. Um, so we have this, we have this uh, the twice declaration at the top and then um, just, you know, as an example, 4 plus 2 times 2 gives you 8 because operator preference precedence prefers 2 times 2, right? But if you parenthesize the 4 plus 2, it'll uh, evaluate that first. <clears throat> and as you can see it at the bottom, it evaluates as you would expect. So there's the call expression, 4 plus 2, um, and it still equals 12, right? 
And the reason for that, and the best way to explain that is to think of it as AST nodes. So here we just have these hypothetical AST nodes, bin op, expr. Um, so you know, it has its operands, and then the x on the right-hand side will be replaced with the expression on, on the left-hand side. So it would look like this. All right? So just it, it nests it. So the operator precedence thing happens as it's parsing the operators. But uh, in this case, we're just, we, we instantiate the body and we substitute the ID expression with the already created expression. So it, it doesn't behave the same as like parentheses, but it does have the same operator precedence that you would expect with the call expression. So does that, does that make sense? Yes. So yeah, that's hygienic macros versus preprocessor macros. So wouldn't you evaluate Yes. Yes, that would be duplicate evaluation. So there is a danger there. And that's why we have the opt-in. Uh, so you could say it's kind of like an advanced feature, but it does open the door to some cool stuff. So it's worth having. I think. Uh, and another thing to mention, the output expression and the, the inputs of the using parameters, it doesn't decay the type or anything. So you know, literals stay literals. So if in the future we want to do interesting things with like string literals, we could do that. Because it doesn't get decayed to a, a pointer or an array or anything. It's still like an AST literal. <coughs> And the original ID expression is replaced entirely. So, so like if it's decal type ID, uh, it isn't necessarily the value category of that parameter. It's the value category of the expression that substituted the ID. Um, and I lied. There's actually another parameter type, and that's the self parameter. Um, so there's a paper by, uh, I believe it's Gaspar Osman and Barry Revson, Simon Brand, and is Casey Carter in that? Nope. Um, it's Ben Dean. <laughs> yeah, it's Ben Dean. It's oh, yeah, Ben Dean. Right, that's, that's right. Uh, so, yeah, P0847, deducing this. Uh, that paper is it, it, it's, it's um, proposing an addition to function templates um, so that you don't have to have like const and non const overloads for functions. There's a few more reasons for that. But because Parm experts, and I didn't mention this yet, but Parm experts are not overloadable. Um, and, and that's problematic when, um, and the way C++ this works is that it's constantness, and, and um, I believe its type is known up front even in a, in a dependent context, so like a template. So, um, so that doesn't work very well with Parm experts, uh, at least because they can't be overloaded. Um, so we have this, this um, well, the this declaration specifier. Uh, and it's, it's always the first parameter. And, and it, it basically, it's just whatever the base expression gets put into this first parameter. And the, the, this specifier is there just to keep you um, sane from making uh, mistakes on arity and whatnot. And uh, one thing to note is that uh, the scope, you can see self.x um, refers to the instance. And x is actually the parameter. But if you didn't have this parameter x here, x would not be resolved because it can't refer to any particular instance x, okay? Because there's no implicit this. So to be clear, this, this adds a member function for what looks like a member function. A member of Parm expert. Yeah, that'd be. Yeah. I was supposed to say that and I forget. <laughs> so yes, uh, Parm experts can be members. And, and we use this, this uh, self parameter for, for uh, looking at the instance of the object. Yes. Right, so you get this in as a reference, but you don't say that. As a reference? Oh. Self is a reference, right? It's implicitly auto reference, yes. Yeah, because that's, that's different than what deducing this does. Oh, really? Uh, because there you actually have to put, you know, this who ref ref self, or this auto ref ref self. Right. This to me looks like the my value parameter. Right, but that's the difference between function templates and Parm experts, uh, in that these are implicitly always bound to a reference. This might be a funny comment, but I'm having a hard time reading this. It's like this self is the same thing as this self. Is this here the name of the variable? Is this here the type of the variable? All right, 
so the comment is, um, what's the difference between this and self here? This uh, is the declaration specifier, and self is just the name I gave it. I could call it anything I want. I just use self because that's easy for me. And, and typical in like a... This is always a value, not a type. So you got to say this is not a type. No, this, in this case, this, and just using the word this is confusing, but this is a declaration specifier. And, and, and that's the way it's proposed in this paper um, for just stating that you're opting into this. Right. So, right. So, right. So, uh, the committee said no. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is kind of a can of worms, at least in my experience with the implementation. Um, it, it, there's a, like a bunch of code that basically asserts that this has. We can talk later. Yeah, check out the deducing yeah, this paper. That's that's uh, that's a uh, all that stuff's uh, in there. All right, and just in my implementation, and I'm not sure if this is exactly how the deducing this paper works, but the input expression expression for the first parameter, the this parameter, is just naively whatever the base expression is. And that, I guess that yeah, confirmed yeah, that's, yeah. that's the way it works with. All right, cool. Um, and the advantage for Parm Expert in this case is that we can add declaration specifiers to this so we can have the using this parameter, which I'm not entirely sure if there's a good use case for this. Uh, just no, there is no, there is no this. There is no this in the body of these. Oh, here? All right, yes. So that's a that's a bug in my implementation that I haven't fixed yet. But uh, so like with the uh, unique pointer. The reason I'm asking it is because of operating overload arrows. Yes. Yes, so unique pointer has an arrow overload. And uh, it the base expression, the result, is a pointer. And that's just a bug I have in my implementation. I, I haven't gotten around to fixing that or knowing what I'm going to do yet. But I think it should just be um, you know turned into a reference. Right. Uh, in an operator overload of an arrow, it's no longer clear what's going on here. What, what the expression is, it's not the thing that is left of the arrow plus uh, the ref, because that's not necessarily what's happening here, so you can overload that operator. Right. Am I clear? Uh, there, there, is, there is some unexplored territory with that, so it's, it is an astute observation, um, but I think, just intuitively thinking about it, I think we could just turn the the pointer, the result, so that there is a result to that base expression. It would be a pointer. We could just turn it into a reference. Somewhere buried deep in the implementation of the new CPR, which is a completely different header or something like yeah. that, you could say, that's my expression, but I wouldn't call that very intuitive to begin with. Um, the thing that you're relying on in the previous slide is that there is no dot operator overload weak today. Right, there is no dot operator. Right, that's right. All right, um, well, maybe we can explore that more uh, and talk about it later. Um, also, there's context for this, or if you refer or prefer West context for there's this context. <laughs> <laughs> so you can order the declaration specifiers, however. Um, and if you don't want this, uh, you can declare it static just like you can with the function. Uh, and there's no, you know, it's just completely independent. It's just in the scope of foo, and it has no. Uh, knowledge of any instance of foo. Sorry about the background of the text there. I thought I fixed that. So uh, operator overloading. Uh, Parm experts can be operators. And uh, here's an example. So I have this namespace mine, and I just I just use an operator name instead of a name an identifier, and I'm just aliasing an um, the equals operator with Hana equal, and I'm forwarding the, the args. Haven't showed FTW. Sorry, FWD. All right. Uh, no, I haven't. 
All right, so if you didn't want to use forwarding, you could just use macro parameters. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the struggle with this, is like trying to give simple examples without using more than one thing. Um, so if you're not familiar with the operator overloading C++, it's a set, uh, a union of sets of lookups uh, of members, member operators, non-members, including ADL, and then of course the built-ins for like integers and whatnot. And if it finds more than one viable candidate, it's considered ambiguous. And, and the way I have it implemented is that if it finds a parm expert alongside a function, um, it's ambiguous, regardless. So I don't even try to instantiate it or anything. And maybe there's a problem with that, but <laughs> I could use some help on that if, I, if you're interested. I can't possibly think of how that will work with spaceships. With what? Oh, spaceships. Spaceships, because you've got so many overloads visible, because you've got like the reverse expression and like the rewritten expression. Ah. It's like, oh my god. So you have multiple overloads of the same operator with oh, the spaceship? We'll, we'll, we'll All right. Too complicated. To All right. Uh, we'll talk about that later then. Um, so. In this case, uh, we have a callable operator, and it makes uh, a callable function object. And, and in this case, you can see I'm using this self, but that doesn't have much meaning, because I'm, one, I'm not using it in the body, but it does get evaluated, of course. Uh, but, but there's no state in this, this, uh, this object ID, which just returns its input. So there is a, there's a paper that addresses this for function templates. Um, and that is to allow static operator overloads. So that you don't have to tie it to an instance because there's actually like I guess the motivation of the papers there's there's uh, potential uh, optimization um, problems with that with the this pointer when you, when you don't even need it because you have a stateless object anyways. My recollection is it got shut down in the big group. Really? So yeah. So news is this was shut down. <laughs> I, I'm curious as to why, but maybe I'll ask you later. Uh, but. Uh, my implementation of ParmExper, I don't restrict the signature of the operator at all. Um, it doesn't create a function or anything. It's just um, used in a lookup for operator overload. So not restricted. Any, any member of ParmExper can be declared static, and that includes the operators. All right. Uh, one of the... Uh, one of the other cool things about ParmExper is that they have a transparent context, at least the ones that map to an expression. And what that means, uh, if you're familiar with Safini, uh, and you can see, I wish I could just keep that there. All right. So the way Safini works is that it, it instantiates a type, and it fails to instantiate the type. It just it doesn't consider that type like in an overload for functions or um, template specialization. Um, and, but that only works on the type. So uh, people do clever things to get information in the type so that like an expression might cause it to fail. Uh, so they, they can encode that in the template parameters or in the return type. Uh, and you can see that being done here for this first overload of foo, uh, where they have a template parameter with decl type of the expression that you see would see in the body. And there's some tricks you have to do to make that like instantiate for maybe something that isn't default constructible. But the cool thing about Permexpert is, is that, uh, as you can see here, oops. Ah. Well, you know what? All right, so yeah, I had a thing to that. <laughs> Anyways, Permexpert are Safini friendly. Their body is just transparent to any, any context like Safini or no except, because it's just a substitution of an expression. So does that, does that make sense? All right. Uh, but that's not necessarily the case for these uh, parm experts that map to an object. They'll, they have a rise scope, and they're declared with a compound statement, and they can have multiple statements, multiple uh, return statements, um, and, and there really isn't uh, a way to, to, to have it participate in the Safini. So <clears throat> this was that, that second variant I was talking about, coalesce to an object. And... Um, so yeah, here's the difference in the declaration syntax of those. So the first one is A plus B. It's just an expression. And, and this is, uh, that's, that's the one that's uh, got the transparent context, but with the, the compound statement, because it's a compound statement, and um, <coughs> the Safina doesn't look through to that. 
And, and one thing to note about this, the differences between the lifetimes of the inputs is that in the first one, because it's just an expression that's substituted, the lifetimes of those variables exist for the full expression that they're called in. But for the rise scope version, they exist for the, uh, the scope that you see here. So the compound, it's like a compound scope. So uh, they die when that little sum or that little end brace dies. So does that make sense? And one potential value I see in that is that you could have these uh, that maybe you, you don't have a bunch of temporaries like if you have these in a, in a, like a deep nest or something like that. Um, so here's a really simple example of just multiple statements or an if statement, multiple return statements. Um, and the, one of the issues I've encountered here is that A, A and B could have different types. So I did use the return type, but I thought I'd be clever, and because I wanted to make this a, an instrument for generic programming, I wanted to make it default to return the decal type auto. <laughs> but the problem with that is that it can be kind of conf confusing if A, maybe A and B are the same type, but they have different value categories. Uh, it would deduce it as a different return type and throw off. It would be a compiler error. So in addition to possibly specifying a return type, what do you guys think? I'm, I'd like to pull the audience on. Should it be implicitly auto or a decal type auto? Yes, so because it's a single object, it has to have a single type, including like R value L value. Yes, in a ternary expression, it can be, because it, it has its own rules for coalescing to a single type. But you can, you can expect like, the operator overload according to the ternary expression, right? Right. Yeah, that's not a good thing. <laughs> I don't know if you put the bandwidth. It's the thing that exists here. It's just the same um, expression and there's two different descriptions. Zach? In this case, um, no, you can't put, it's just like a function, if, if you think about it. So you couldn't put int and double for A and B because they're, you know, they're, you're returning two different types and because at runtime, it could branch to either one of these return statements. Obviously it has to write to a single object that has to have one type, just like a function. Yes. They have to be the same. It's just like function uh, type deduction. Or really? All right. Uh, I I so, would actually uh, be sorry. Just say it's something like Zach, different. Zach Lane said that he wants decal type file. Just yeah. for the record. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> I, I'd rather you be consistent with lambdas. All right. So uh, the comment was that we should be consistent with lambdas, which implicitly return by by value. Uh, one issue I had with returning decal type auto is like I had a series of functions that would turn a reference. One of them I forgot to specify decal type auto. It would return a value and then the, re the next function would turn a reference and it would end up with a dangling, dangling reference. So there is a danger there, but yeah, maybe it is better to make it consistent with functions because people know what to expect. It, in this case, and the way I have it implemented is like decal type auto. Uh, the question is, can you use if const expert? I'll get to that in one sec. Um, I was mentioning about the ternary expression. This is how you do it with the the expression variant, and you could just you could you could solve the same problem just by relying on the the mechanics of a ternary expression. Yeah, you could use using a and b here too as well. Oh yes. Well, yeah. So yeah, the ternary already has its own lazy evaluation, but. Oh, yes, you're right. Yes, so in this case, A and B get evaluated up front. Um, so in this case, you would want using A and B. So. Right. So the context for if. Uh, this, is, this is something I, I want, but Parmexpers do not 
do so well. Uh, as you can see, um, A and B are macro parameters, and they wouldn't get evaluated unless unless uh, the const expert condition chooses that alternative and it would drop the other one, right? So it could be different return types. Um, the problem with this is, is that the way I have, and I believe it has to be with Parm Experts, is that the inputs at the call expression all have to be resolved. And this has to do with um, you know, lookup and um, also dealing with compile time and runtime computations. Um, so the problem is that it wouldn't necessarily get evaluated at runtime, but the semantic analysis and everything will have to happen on A and B, regardless of whether or not it knows the condition, which is kind of a problem. So the nicety about context per if is that it can drop that alternative as, as eager as it wants to, or I think it has to. Um, but with, with the Parm expert, it cannot do that. The interface does not allow that. So it would be nice to, and if somebody hasn't written a paper, may, maybe I will, or it would be nice if somebody wrote a paper on having a context per ternary that would do this. And that would be a useful uh, augment to this. All right, parameter packs. Um, cool thing, uh, as I mentioned before, um, expressions include expressions that don't contain parameter packs. And for our purposes, we have to think of expressions as having two different kinds. Um, vanilla expressions and expressions that contain an unexpanded parameter pack. Uh, and this is important because uh, I ran into a little problem. In my implementation, I actually had this working at, at one point. So I had this using two pack, and it takes a, a parameter pack, its inputs, and it just returns the parameter pack, uh, which has, has some utility in, um, so you don't have to use like type deduction or whatnot to, um, to structure a parameter pack. Uh, but the problem, well, here's how it's used. So it's just two pack. You can see the call expression here is just, it just takes one, two, and three, and it turns it into a pack, and then uses it in a full expression to make the sum, and you can see the result six. So does that, does that make sense to everyone so far? Is that cool? <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> All right. super cool. All right, it's, uh, it's cool. Um, but it doesn't work this way. And I found this out the hard way, like after I made a blog post about this and everything, I finally tried it in a dependent context. And because x, x here, as you, as you can see, we don't know what it is. Oops. And uh, so we don't even know what, at that point, we don't even know what two pack is. Lookup could find something else. It doesn't even know that it's a parametric expression. It could be a function. Um, and the, the error I get is pack expansion does not contain any ex unexpanded parameter pack. So how does it know that it would con could contain a parameter, uh, parameter pack? And, and as I said before, there's two different types of or kinds of expressions that we're, we're working with here. And um, it's, not, it's not valuable to in, for in a dependent expression that maybe this thing returns a parameter pack or maybe it doesn't. It always has to be one or the other. So the solution to that problem is to add a little postfix tilde. And, and, uh, Credit for this goes to Arthur O'Dwyer and, and some others. Uh, they had a discussion on the Stenner's proposal mailing list. Uh, in addition, he made a, a blog post about this paper, kind of dissing it and, and showing how uh, how uh, it wouldn't work with packs of packs, which I'll show you in a second. But he, he introduced me to this postfix tilde, and uh, I implemented it, and, and it works. So in, in this case, this is a declaration, of course. You see that little tilde at the end of the argument list. Uh, right now in my implementation, it's after the ID. But I put it at the end of the, uh, the parameter list just to, to make it look consistent with um, call expressions. So this means the output expression must contain a parameter pack. Does that make sense? And so this is how, it, how it's used. You see the declaration has the, uh, the postfix tilde and then the call expression here has the postfix tilde after it, and it means everything before this tilde in this expression contains a, uh, a per unexpanded parameter pack somewhere. So that, then the compiler knows and, and won't complain. Yeah. So the statement is that it would be clearer if we use three dots. Uh, 
my argument to that is that it would make it ambiguous with pack expansion because we're creating a pack here, okay. but then it later gets expanded. You could use the size of dot 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 grammar. So if you have right. a pack dot 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 of x, then I think that might not be ambiguous. Right. So the statement is that we could have the dot 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 after the ID of the parametric expression. I'll show you why. I used to have the tilde after the ID, and I'll show you why I moved it to the end. Um, was there another question over here? Uh, same question. Oh, all right. Yeah. You'll forgive me, but I just don't like the tilde at the end. It's too cute. There's the D cell. Um, it falls into the trap of the plus in boost hammer. You never spot it because, of course, it's plus decal type, open many parentheses, a huge long line that's about 10 lines long. You mean the unionary plus? You just, yeah, and you just don't see that plus in front to convert from hammer types to real types real objects, and if you don't have it there, the error message is utterly opaque. And so I just feel that that, that grammar style is a little too cute, and it's, it's not searchable at all. And again, if you want to try and um, search from the internet, what's my error message? You know, Google, search for til C++ tilde. Good luck. All right. Well, you could say, uh, so the, the statement is that it's too cute and not easy to spot. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Um, and um, it would be difficult to like Google. Um, I would say if you wanted to Google it, you could call it the postfix tilde. <laughs> but this is kind of just what we're running with um, because previously I didn't have anything. <laughs> so, so if you have a, you know, come up with something better, feel free to send me an email or even write a paper, Bennett. All right. Oh, yeah. So this means it contains a peg. Um, so in addition to that, uh, in, in, that, in that blog post, he had suggested that things like tuples could be destructured into a pack uh, by just putting a little, the tilde after the ID expression or the expression um, for that yielding a tuple. Um, so I implemented the ability to overload an operator, the postfix tilde operator, as a parmexpr. Um, and as you can see, I'm, I'm returning a, a pack of its members, of this, this foo object. And um, one thing you might note is that self, you see self twice in the output expression, and you would think, well, that would be duplicate evaluation. But in, in the context of pack expansion, you actually expect duplicate evaluation. Um, and here's how you would use that. So we have this foo object. Um, and, and in the ID expression, you just put the uh, postfix tilde after it. And it just turns it into a pack using whatever you specified in your permexpert, your overload. And then, um, no, no. So uh, the way I implement it is that it's just a tilde. So the 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 name the name of the operator, it looks like this because it was very confusing to to uh, to implement it alongside the prefix tilde. So I just I put the the parentheses. I could theoretically add the parentheses to that. Uh, I just had, I didn't do that. So what's the zero element of the pack in either expansion? Is it um, interval, like, is it interval constant four, or is it a little bit four, a little bit bigger? Four, oh. Um, it's, in this case, it's just uh, self.member1. Pretty much. I, I like this as a completely separate <laughs> Yeah, so this is just something I was playing with, but I did I added it to the paper. If you guys think it's too crazy, I can take it out and put it in something separate. No, no it's not too crazy. It's usable. It's I too think crazy. It might be just a little bit too much for some committee members to swallow. And instead of you getting bogged down with extraneous comments that aren't necessarily pertinent, if it's split into two papers, then it means you have hopefully a big fat tick for one paper. People arguing the toss over the second, but paper one doesn't get sorted. All right. Yeah, like, like expands to pack with an arbitrary object, and then a uh, destructor object <coughs> would be super useful. So yeah, I was going to ask you guys. So well, the comment was that we should separate it into two papers, so it doesn't get the whole thing doesn't go down as one big, you know, Titanic. But uh, so what do you guys think? Uh, as this is a possibility for an overload for structured bindings. 
Uh, and I'm asking you guys. <laughs> uh, can, can we? We already have a way to do that, though. How, how is it? Uh, for tuple sign and then tuple, and you make a member called dad. Can, can All right. You show us what you mean. But you can do like tuple expand in lines and fold expression over that. Sure, like, but for structured bindings. So, sure, yeah. so the same is you can already overload structured bindings with tuple like and, and get. And I heard that it, somebody said it sucks. <laughs> Uh, and that's the author of uh, a, a tuple implementation. Um, so here's an example of how you can't really necessarily do this. I mean, you can with, as it was just mentioned, with the, the tuple-like. Uh, but if you had integer sequence, it doesn't have members. Like, so I think structs, do they get destructured on their members already? Yeah. All right. But in this case, it doesn't have members. It's in the template parameters. So we could implement this postfix tilde as a just returning its its template parameter. Just a general purpose packet, uh, packet. Yeah. Packet. Uh, and and the, the binding of this in this context, I haven't tried this, so I don't know that it works. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure theoretically it, it should work, but I just put that as a disclaimer <laughs> because X is not in the body of the output expression. Uh, and, and there's a paper for, and I think this is Barry Revson and Casey Carter. For structure bindings, can I introduce a pack? This got, this is, has a very uncertain future. So the statement is that it has an uncertain future. Um, I'm surprised about that, because it seems like a slam dunk. Uh, yeah, it does, but then you talk to the users. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so as far as so some, I, I heard on Slack that Implementing this would be difficult. I don't. I disagree with that because the my implementation of Parmax kind of proves that. And I think the concern is that you can have this parameter pack outside the context of a template, so you could have it in like a main function. But that's not a problem. Where I don't think it's a problem because uh, I implemented it in Clang, uh, as you saw earlier. I just I just turned something into a pack, and that can be outside the context of of a a template. And, and I did encounter that problem in the implementation. And my solution was just, it was basically just to take the expressions that it would resolve to, and I just wrap it in an AST node. And then during the parsing phase, or um, I just check to see if all the packs would be resolved, and then I expand it before it even reaches template instantiation. Um, and another assertion that this paper makes that I, I don't agree with is that it should be ill-formed to have a non-trailing pack. And it says that, that the idea is that it would be consistent with function parameter packs. I don't really see the reason for that. And my only understanding of trailing packs in function template parameters is because of, uh, or the restriction is because of type deduction. And I'm not really sure about that. But since we don't have to deal with that, I don't, I don't think we should have that needless restriction. Do you guys agree with that? All right, so it has. So this, one of the statements was uh, that it could be the default argument that would prevent that possibility. But I think that I think it's also to do with type deduction, right? Or is it is it just because of the default argument? I, I don't know if it's just because, but that's definitely true. Of All right. Um, the way I implement it is I allow the pack in any position, but if that would be so, here's an example of why you would want that. Uh, if you've looked at uh, like for instance Hana tuples, boost Hana. Tuples, I think it's called dropback, but the, it has the ability to drop the last element in the tuple. But to do that, or maybe it was to, to get the last element in the tuple. It's not simple. It has to do some, some folding and recursing because there's no way just to get the last element in a pack. So yeah, I already asked the question, why not? Um, and as I mentioned before, Arthur O'Dwyer had a blog post called Packs of Packs where he, he uh, introduced me to the concern that you could have packs contained in packs, and how would it be expanded? Like in this case, you can see you can see the pack expansion. And, and you see this iota parmexper. It just returns a pack. So <clears throat> which pack gets expanded? And, and in this case, obviously, one of them is not getting expanded. So how would you expand both of them? Um, my solution to that was just to restrict the operands 
Oh yeah, there's a cat there. So we're just restricting uh, when we when we look at the arguments uh, before we even we even instantiate it. We just say, does it contain it? Does it, any of these input expressions to contain an unexpanded parameter pack? And if it does, it's an error. And that was really really simple to implement. And I think that fixes that ambiguity issue. So overloading with functions. This is hypothetical. Should they? Should Parm express overload with function? My feeling is no. So one of the comments was no. All right. So it's not it's not currently supported. There could be some value in this because of the utility that Parm express have, and and maybe you could have it overloaded with constructors or as as it was mentioned, the spaceship operator. Um, Craziness that I'm not really familiar with. Um, currently, ADL is not supported for Parm Expert. So how do you uh, do operators? It would it would still participate in overloading and try to instantiate. You it would end up using whatever rules we come up with for, with for the overloading. Uh, one idea was to like a lot have lookup prefer Parm Experts before functions. That that could be a way of uh, transforming stuff to make it compatible. So, so that that's the reason that I don't like um, allowing them to overload with functions is because I I suspect that whatever however we would make it work it would involve um, some some modification to uh, uh, overload resolution you know either preferring one or the other and it's it's like I C is just a, like a, a series of complicated lookup systems, and I don't want to make any of the ones that we have any more complicated. All right, I don't need to repeat that, right? <laughs> so it, yeah, you, you're right. It could make it needlessly complicated. Um, so here's just an example of trying to do that, and I didn't have to do anything to make this work. It just did it by default. Redefinition of ID is a different kind of symbol. That's just the way C++ already works currently, or at least the compiler. Yeah. Yeah, different namespaces is fine. But uh, I don't see how there would be a conflict if they're in different namespaces. Oh, oh, you mean like a using directive to introduce it into the current namespace? Is that what your mean? Your meaning is? Um, yeah, that would be that would be an error. No, it would be an ambiguity. It would, it would be. I think it would be the same error. It would be a redefinition. Um, well, in this case, redefinition of parametric expression ID. I, I think. No, no, he's not saying that. He's, he's, he's saying it would it would work just as it does for any other type of entity. Yeah, the the lookup stuff is not something I touched. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I, I didn't go into lookup at all because it is uh, kind of a a rat's nest. <laughs> or the implementation is kind of hairy. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it's theoretically possible. It could be difficult to implement, um, and as it was mentioned, possibly overly complex. All right, so we got 25 minutes left. Uh, now I'm going to start going over motivating use cases. Um, and as I mentioned before, the context for ternary, uh, I would actually like to see this as a language feature, so it would actually drop one of the alternatives when it, if it knew what the condition was. Um, but in this case, it, this is useful because we can have a different return type based off of the condition. And the only other way to do this is to have like some kind of function name direction. So it just this just makes the interface kind of flat. Um, and concise forwarding, uh, I showed you earlier the FWD. Um, this is it implemented as a preprocessor macro. And I'm, I'm kind of surprised why we don't have something like that in the standard. Do we even have any kind of macro in the standard? Assert, all right. Uh, I think it would be interesting to have forward as a preprocessor macro. And, and the reason is, it's a text change. It can actually be faster. 
And typically with forwarding, you don't need like the ability to refactor it. Uh, like you don't need to keep the information in the AST or whatever uh, for that kind of stuff. So here you can see the difference. Uh, forward's a lot simpler. You don't have to have the, S, the stood forward with the, the decal type X or whatever. Um, and here's it implemented as a Parmax bar. So it can, do, it can do this. So we could have it in a namespace if we wanted to. So that's the one advantage over the, pro, the preprocessor macro. Um, and concise forwarding. Uh, there was a, a talk, I think it was Vittorio Romeo did a lightning talk called, you type this three, you must type it three times. And here's an example of that. Um, so you have the no accept to propagate no acceptness. And you have the return type to allow it to be finite friendly on what it's, what it's actually going to do, that's expression. And then you actually have the body, which, which has the expression in it as well. So you can see you have to type it three times. Um, with parametric expressions, you only have to type it once. There was also the context for context per, I believe, at that point. Oh, context per, context per? I don't, that, that I don't remember. Like a follow up. Would. <laughs> Do you think that would be propagated here? Oh, yeah. All right, so, I mean, yeah. This is, right, right. So, yeah, this is this is a lot simpler. And, and in cases where you just have, you know, something simple where you only use the value, the variable once, I like to use the macro parameters. Um, and another use case for ParmExpert is lazy evaluation. So with the, the ParmExpert, it, it doesn't bind it to a variable. The variable doesn't, if it has the using declaration, it doesn't get emitted at all. Um, and if you don't, if it doesn't have an ID expression in the body, it won't get substituted anywhere. So you'll lose that information, and, and you can see that it wouldn't evaluate that. And so this is, you could almost think that this was by accident, um, lazy evaluation. Um, so here's an example of debug logging, and, and I made it simple. Um, so I have a context for log level, and I just return a different type, and a stream operator, as you can see, just drops its input. So it, it never evaluates anything on the right-hand side of that stream operator uh, if, you, if you get that null stream. And, and the idea is that, um, you know, like this expression here, maybe it's not a string literal. Maybe it's something that does some kind of side effects. Maybe it allocates something. Uh, you wouldn't want it to do that uh, if it's not even going to actually run the warning. Um, so this is a way of, of uh, kind of like short-circuiting that. Yeah. Is it a question about how this might interact with reflection? If I have a macro parameter and I pass in a function call expression and then I reflect on that, will I get the name of the variable that's been introduced in the scope and, or the expression that was passed in originally? So the question is how would it work with the reflection? Um, <coughs> I don't know. <laughs> so they have reflections on a call expression for a function. Obviously, they haven't specified it for Permexper because they probably don't even know what it is. So that's something that was would have to be explored. But that is uh, an interesting question. Uh, disjunction. Uh, if you've ever used like JavaScript or PHP or Python, they have this, and we also have it in C++. But you can't you can't overload the these operators and get the same uh, short circuit evaluation. So as you can see here, I, I just check to see, my foo object just checks to see if its length is zero, or I'm sorry, greater than zero. And then uh, it'll use that. Otherwise, it'll just use the, its, uh, its uh, right-hand side. And for instance, like foo world creates a string. You wouldn't want it to like create a string if you weren't going to actually use it. So this is an, a flat and idiomatic way of just providing a default. Does that make sense? Conjunction, uh, same concept, only um, you can kind of think of this as a monadic interface <laughs> uh, where I just have, uh, you know, I have a stateful object with an is stopped value. And once it's stopped, is stopped is true, it won't evaluate anything after that. Yes. So the question, or yeah, the question is, is it inlines? Is that basically what you're asking? Yes. There, so there's no function, 
and it's, it's so it, it wouldn't get inline because there's nothing to inline. But yeah, it's just generating as if you wrote it there in the first place. So it could it could result in a lot of code generation. But uh, the argument I have for that is that there's a lot of cases where you, you don't care about that. Like, like let's say accessing a member of a tuple. You know, there's a bunch of function calls to unwrap unwrap stuff, and then um, you know, you don't do any kind of additional runtime computation, so it doesn't matter where it gets in line. Um, uh, and I, I would also argue that the optimizer could get good at outlining from experts. So that's that's a possibility. That's not been explored. <laughs> um, and there is a paper uh, on <coughs> introducing lazy uh, well lazy evaluation to functions or function templates. Um, <coughs> So it's not a new idea. Uh, their declaration syntax has kind of like a lambda syntax because at the call site, I, I believe, if I understand it correctly, it's implicitly like wrapped in a kind of like a lambda. Uh, and that's how it controls evaluation. Um, and an interesting note, it, in the call expression, um, there's no call site marker that indicates that there could be lazy evaluation. And I believe that was a concern that they wanted to pull the, the committee about and unfortunately, I think that the committee, or at least the incubator uh, poll, was that they were highly in favor of a call site marker in, in a call expression. Well, what would you guys think about that? Would you like something like, let's say, um, right here at the call site, like an exclamation mark on log, just because this might not get evaluated? Any preferences on that? Right. Just for re uh, code review, if someone doesn't go and refactor it themselves. All right. I wouldn't take the exclamation mark because that's the other way around in Haskell. All right. And yeah. To make it not, uh, not lazy. Yeah. So whatever hypothetical syntax it would be. Right. Uh, well, one solution to that is to allow actual call expressions to also be have the marker on it, even though it would evaluate it. So that would be a way of making it generic. But it would be ugly, I think. So I don't necessarily want to call site marker. I think that when you use a function, all, all sorts of crazy things could happen. <laughs> uh, so you know, you look at the documentation of the function, and you should know what to expect. So. Um, yeah, the, the declaration. Oh, yeah. So it's like a lambda-like syntax for the parameter declaration, and this is a separate paper. Okay, is this the parameter? Yes. It, no, no, no. So, so this is completely separate to Parm Experts. It's a, co a totally different competing paper. Uh, you could say. Lazy evaluated parameters. Yeah. Yes. So. No, yes, it is. It, it's uh, the call the call site. I think the idea of it is, if I understand it correctly, is the call site right here implicitly wraps it in a lambda. I I could be wrong about that. Yeah. Say that again. All right. So the the author confirmed it that it is not it is not a syntax for generating lambdas. Right, I'm just curious, what is your opinion on the call site syntax? James. <laughs> How do we play with this thing? That's um, like a mic drop. I was not particularly in favor of having an indicator at the call site. Uh, I'm working on an updated version of this paper that I feel both good and bad about uh, this. Notice that we could proceed the lazy parameter with uh, empty parens, and that indicates something about it being passed as a callable. Um, the, the evolution working group was pretty clear that they didn't want this feature if it allows uh, things that look like function calls that just might not evaluate some of their arguments. So there may be more wiggle room for overloading operators because they already do that. All right.
All right, uh, so we're going to get about 15 minutes. So moving forward, uh, Parm Experts also can provide friendlier interfaces. Uh, and you can think of it as a facade layer. You could even just take existing interfaces and just um, throw a Parm Expert in front of it to make some changes, to, to do things like uh, compile time checks on inputs. And an example of that, uh, so I saw this on Twitter, um, an example of using CTRE, uh, as you may recall that the pattern is a template parameter. Um, and at least in C++ 17, you have to, I, I believe you have to declare the string, and correct me if I'm wrong with static linkage, is that right? Um, so yeah, you have to have declared up front, has to have static linkage before you can use it as a template parameter. So that's what's going on here. Um, and then of course you have to throw it in the angle brackets. And so what I'm doing here with the match parm expert is that we're just hiding that declaration and the the uh, the angle brackets syntax. Um, and there's a paper called text formatting. I didn't put that at the top. Uh, written by Viktor Sverovich. Uh, it's the format library, uh, similar to Python. And this is the interface. Uh, this is not the ParmExper interface. This is the function interface. And as you can see, the input for the format string is a string view. And uh, the problem is, is uh, I, I think one of the selling points is that there would be compile time checks on that format string. Do you guys think that's possible with this? All right. But we're, we're, we're fairly confident that we, we could, we, that we've left enough room to be able to do it in the future. All right, so there's confidence that it's forward compatible with compile time checking on a string. And um, I'm curious about that. Um, so one thing with this interface is that the string doesn't necessarily have to be a string literal. We already sort of have this from how the technology is just set up. Like you could do something, you could do this quick, like the, the built in constant foo. Uh, like people fucking around with. Yeah. Uh, see, th th there's already built in to determine whether, whether a, a, a string well, is a parable. Right, but the interface doesn't really express that. Do you guys document that it has to be a string literal? Uh, no, no, no. But I'm saying your, your compiler magic, you can tell it's a string literal. Right. All right. Uh, we, we could probably discuss that particular yeah, topic. I think the very question is fallacious. Like, the format is uh, an overload set, not uh, you can totally not take a string in the future. Right? Like, the format library is an overload set. It's not a single function template. So right. Oh, right. OK, I see. All right, so if, if we had Parm Experts, though, we could theoretically make that string literal a context expert parameter or even a using parameter where it gets used in a context expert context, so it has to be context expert. Um, but we don't have those in C20. Uh, so, yeah, so they'll, ha they'll, we'll have to, they'll have to figure something else out. Uh, and they say it's forwards compatible. Um, so, here's another example uh, passing overloaded functions. Uh, right now, you can't just pass it around as an object like. For in this example, we have std max um, is an overloaded function. And the way to like generically pass it to a function, and here we have like some forwarded list, and we're reducing it using this reducer function. We have to wrap it in a lambda and forward its args to std max. With permexpert, we can just pass std max as a using parameter. And if you wanted to use it as a, I don't know, I have a slide for this, but if you wanted to use it as a, a parameter to, as a callable object that to pass to a function, you could just wrap it in something that puts it in a lambda implicitly, uh, just as you could with a preprocessor macro. All right, so um, 
Another thing, and this is kind of a joke, but we can, with Perm Experts, we can get a language tuple. Uh, well, I'll fake language tuple. <laughs> and so just this hypothetical interface, we have um, a function that makes a tuple of tuples. And here you can see we were passing in a, you know, a tuple xs, ys, and then a literal, or a, should I say a brace init list uh, that contains different types. And this is not possible with function templates, uh, unless you know what the type of, of that third tuple would be in the function signature. Um, and so here's just a note, uh, direct list initialization, copy list initialization, for, for our purposes, they behave the same way, or at least in my, what I'm about to show you. Um, but it's worth noting that one has XS followed by the brace init list, and another one is separated by a token. Uh, so in my implementation, uh, I have to use the token because I can't just juxtapose two ID expressions unless, unless we were to allow a postfix ID expression. Uh, but here you can see I'm just I'm kind of making an indirection with the scoped parmexpr to create UC tad to create a tuple, uh, and that's how the interface is achieved. So that's just one example of something you could do. <clears throat> All right, just to go over quickly, and then we'll have some time for questions. Uh, crazy library stuff. Uh, so I, I did this, uh, I messed around with Bustana's implementation of basic tuple. And basic tuple is supposed to be the lightweight tuple. Um, and uh, to access an element of a tuple, you call HANA at. And there's like, you could say there's a, a couple of functions in the stack to, to actually get to that element. And uh, so instantiating those function templates have a, has, a, has a cost associated with it. And, and when, I, when I first did this, I was expecting something a little better. I was actually disappointed by this benchmark. But um, I'm going to, I have a hunch that the problem here, and you can see uh, HANA's implementation uh, doesn't scale as well. Um, and, and you can see it's like 60% faster for the Parmexper, re replacing all the function templates with Parmexpers. Uh, and I, I think it's because of name mingling of the function template instantiation. Yes? All right, so the, the statement was that HANA basic tuple is, or stood tuple is actually like 16 times slower than this. And, and as I said, basic tuple is actually the lightweight tuple, and the fast one. Uh, and, and I just, I modified it with Parmexpers uh, to just get slightly better performance. Um, so I think it's because of name mangling. When you instantiate the definition of a function, it creates a mangled name. And these are, are not trivial. Uh, but here's a trivial function template that takes a T, and if you give it a basic tuple with about like just a little under 300 elements, this is its mangled name. Um, and something worth noting is the Itanium ABI has encoding so that, so this is a, a tuple of integer, uh, integer constants, integral constants. You, you only see the name integral constant once, uh, if you can read that. Sorry if it's so small. <laughs> Uh, so it makes an encoding for it, and it uses that encoding throughout the, the rest of the tuple to save space. But despite that, it's still about 4, 4K. And this is just one function call with that tuple. It's not even the tuple itself. It's just a function call with the tuple. <clears throat> uh, and this is the constructor for basic tuple. <laughs> and, and the reason it's so much bigger is that uh, the function's signature has a um, an index sequence that it uses to destructure a parameter pack because it needs it for some meta programming stuff. So that ends up in the mangled name. And it's about, it's a little under uh, 7K to construct the tuple. Um, so that's for one function call. So in the, the meta bench for HANA at, it actually calls at C, which is like a convenience function that sits on on top of HANA at, but it takes a template parameter uh, for convenience, uh, so you can just give it a literal uh, number. Uh, and that calls HANA at, and that calls at impl, which, you know, it's, it's, it dispatches to different implementations. In this case, it would be at impl for basic tuple. And then uh, 
then it has an internal EBL get function. So that's four function calls. So like it would be, you could say it's 4K times four. Um, so just to look at the implementation real fast, here's it as Etsy as a, a parmexper, um, and I just make it as a function object. And I lift, I lift the input that, that the size t to um, an integral constant because it could be dispatching to a different impl of, of uh, like let's say just for the regular tuple, which could be a function. So I had to be compatible with different implementations. So it could be parmexper, it could be a function. So I left it to integral constant. <clears throat> So uh, here's the basic tuples, or I'm sorry, HANA, boost HANA's at operator implementation. And I actually ripped out the concept checks. But it, all it does is it has an alias for the tag. And it dispatches, uh, it uses this dispatch to get the impl type. And then it just calls it. It propagates its inputs to that impl. So it does not, no additional runtime computation. And, and in fact, this whole stack does not do any additional runtime computation. So you'd always expect these to get inline. Um, so here's the Parmexper version of that. And because you can't forward declare, and it's worth mentioning, um, Parmexpers cannot be forward declared. So it, uh, one that's, it, it, it can create like the chicken and egg problem, I suppose. But uh, it means we don't have to deal with multiple declarations and having to track, like look up when you define one. You wouldn't have to look up a previous declaration and, and then merge the two. So there's only one declaration. It's not redeclarable. Really So yeah, here's, here's the implementation. And, and I just put the aliases inside the body of the class, or the aliases. Uh, so here's at impl for, um, for boost HANA's at impl for basic tuple tag. This is a function template. And it calls that, it just calls the EBO get. So it's just dispatching to another function. Um, so here's the Parmex version of that. It's, it's a little more complicated because I had to, uh, and, and I actually do the casting to the, the, the base type because the way the tuple works is it uses base classes for the empty base op optimization. And each base class contains the data member. Um, so I'm, I'm basically unwrapping that with this forward cast, which is kind of like forward-like, but it casts it to the EBO type. So it's not simple, but it works. <laughs> um, and this is, I think that I could have gotten a better benchmark except for this. And the reason for this, uh, so this is my EBO class. And it's not EBO get, it's EBO with a get from expert in it. Um, but I have to do some, uh, I have to specialize on whether it's an empty type or not. Because there's some casting I have to do that. And uh, as you may notice that for every key value, this is going to get instantiated. And, and this EBO type, when it gets instantiated, it instantiates all the declarations. And then when you finally call get, it actually instantiates that. So there's like a Cartesian, project, pro, uh, Cartesian product of instantiation. So I think there's a, uh, still a, a performance issue there. And I think that if I had the const the per ternary expression, uh, I think I could uh, totally bypass this. So just to recap, um, parmexpers can be used to improve interfaces, make them flatter. Uh, it can reduce type bloat, as I just showed you. And if you're interested in following the continued development of Parmexpers, uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I don't really tweet much, but it's always typically about C++. Uh, or you can check it out on GitHub. I have a couple interesting C++ projects. Uh, is there a question? Yeah. I wonder how this plays with modules. I don't know. But it's really, it's just, it's like a type alias. You could think of it. It doesn't have any linkage. It's just a name. So there really isn't any complication there. You could, ex you could export it just like you would ex export a type alias. Um, and if, if you check out my slides, I have some links to the papers I mentioned. And of course, thanks to Louis Dion for, for making Boost HANA. <laughs> and, and that's all I have. If you guys, uh, we're past time now, so uh, if you guys want to field any questions. Thank you.